All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our second workshop, second uh, parenting workshop series sponsored by Asset School. Um, my name is Dr. Elsa Lee. I'm the clinical director and a licensed psychologist here at the Transforming Life Center at Asset School. So um, before I begin, I would like to let you all know that this workshop um, will be recorded, and I would encourage those who may have any questions or any comments to make regarding um, your own child to refrain from sharing um, confidential and personal information um, because this workshop will be publicly shared um, on our YouTube channel. So um, if you have any questions or um, you know specific uh, comments that you want to make about your child, feel free to side chat me or um, you can always email me afterwards and we can talk further. All right. So welcome again to everyone. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. So the topic for tonight's talk is about ADHD, right? Um, we want to help you guys understand more about ADHD and how to manage the symptoms of ADHD in children. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, so here are some objectives that I would like to cover for tonight's workshop. Um, I'm an objective goals kind of a person, so I always want to make it clear to my audience um, and people that I work with, what are some of those things that I'd like to achieve through the workshop that I'm presenting on tonight. So I would very much like for you guys to know what ADHD means, what is the definition of that, um, what does it look like, right? what are the symptoms, um, is there anything that might remind you of your child or someone you know? Right? We want to have a good understanding of what ADHD really is and what it means, um, how it is diagnosed, um, how do we mental health or medical professionals decide if it's ADHD or not, what are the criteria, risk factors, um, risk factors meaning what are some contributing factors, uh, things that um, you know could increase the chance of a child being diagnosed with this condition, um, what are some of those things that we do know about that could reduce the chances or um, things that we can do, which brings me to the next point, which is interventions and ways to support our children. Um, and then we certainly would wrap up with some uh, questions that I've received uh, submitted by parents uh, ahead of time, and I've selected a couple of uh, most frequently asked questions to share with you all. And again, if we run out of time for any reason, I can't address all the questions that I've received, um, feel free to side chat me or email afterwards, and I would compile all the unanswered questions and put together a document and send it to um, all the parents who may be interested in getting all the answers that are raised by uh, questions that are raised by other parents. Okay, so these are the objectives. So let's get started. So let's look at the definition. Um, what is ADHD, right? So here's the good old boring definition, but a very important one. So the definition of ADHD stands for this. It's a neurodevelopmental disorder, and it's marked by developmentally inappropriate levels of inattention and or impulsivity and hyperactivity, or that's a mouthful. What does that really mean? Now, do, do neurodevelopmental disorders are a group of disorders um, that affect the development of uh, our central nervous system. So in other words, ADHD is a disorder that is related to our brain development. So it is a brain-related disorder. It is a biological condition. And unlike perhaps what some of the some parents or even sometimes teachers might think, um, ADHD is not a condition by choice. This is not simply a behavioral issue or a problem that is um, that is exhibited by a child at will, right? This is not a choice that is made by the child deciding that they want to act out they want to be loud, they want to be hyperactive, right? It's not about the child being naughty or they're choosing to be defiant and, and being difficult, right? That's just plainly not true. This is an actual brain-related disorder. It, there has a biological basis to it, right? So what we do know is um, the brains of children with this condition, they do develop differently than those who don't have ADHD. And we're going to go more deeply into how the brains look different um, when we talk about risk factors, all right? So that's just, um, a, you know, an overarching definition, an umbrella understanding of what ADHD is and what it isn't. Um, now, there are three main uh, features of uh, ADHD, core features of ADHD. We can go on to the next slide. So three main features. Um, 
before I actually go into the th three features, let me just highlight the point that not everyone will have all these same features, right? Not everyone is going to, not everyone with ADHD is going to struggle with inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity. And I'm going to elaborate on a little bit, a little bit more on, um, you know, how do we, how do we look at these features and decide if they meet criteria for the diagnosis and whatnot. But just for your information, there are three main features that we do look at um, that would raise a red flag for clinicians and for parents. So the first one is inattention. Now, what is inattention? Some parents would say, well, it's, a, it's the inability to focus. You can't um, pay attention to what is being said to you. My child just can't seem to concentrate when they're working. So these are just some common examples of complaints that are made by both parents and teachers. We hear a lot, oh, my child's not paying attention to details. Um, my child is having a lot of trouble focusing on their tasks. Um, they can't stay on tasks, they just can't finish what they start, or they skip items when they read questions, they make tons of careless mistakes, um, you know, sometimes on math problems, they know how to do it, but they just keep messing up the addition and the subtraction sign. Why? Not because they don't know how to do the, the problem, but because they just simply weren't paying attention to what they're asked to do. So they lost points right? Um, easily distracted by other things. Distractibility is a signature core feature that we always um, do observe and we, we always hear about. Um, zoning out, spacing out, daydreaming. These are all terms that we hear a lot. Um, when someone's talking to the child, you know, the child seems to be someplace else, just, you know, their mind is wandering. They're not really listening, you know. Um, they need the directions to be repeated, Oh, wait, what did you say again, mom? Wait, what What was that again? Oh, wait, I, what, what? You know, there's a lot of, huh, what? Um, a lot of repetitions for, for directions or commands or instructions are sometimes needed. Um, not being able to follow through the task, not being able to initiate, finish what they start. Now, to highlight a couple of points about the inattention and the distractibility, um, just a little bit further, because these are the most notable um, and what I would say the most defining features of the inattentive type of ADHD is that um, the children or individuals with inattention often struggle to maintain their concentration, right? So they may be able to focus for a little bit, but it's quite hard to maintain the concentration. It's hard for them to sustain their attention. And it's, it's quite hard for them to persist with the tasks, especially the ones that require a lot of effort. Tasks that are boring, um, tasks that are tedious, uh, repetitive, um, those are even harder. Now, sometimes I hear parents asking me this, um, actually pretty frequently, I would say, and they wonder, you know, does my child really have ADHD? You know, because, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to focus if the task is boring, or they would say, you know, my child's able to focus on video games for hours. Um, without a problem, they can read a book and sit there and just, you know, have no problem watching TV or finishing a three hour movie. So I don't think my child really has ADHD. And this is something that we hear a lot. Now, one of the key factors in the inattentive type of ADHD is that um, there is a, what we call a dysregulation of a specific brain chemical. It's called dopamine. You guys may have heard of this term, dopamine. So a do dopamine is it's a we'll call it a neurotransmitter. It's a chemical in your brain, and that the dopamine plays a critical role in things like motivation, in um, maintaining the reward system, and also paying attention, redirecting people's attention. So individuals with ADHD um, often have lower levels of um, you know, dopamine activity, they, they're they less active in um, being able to kind of maintain, helping the child to maintain their focus because um, of a brain chemical, a neurotransmitter imbalance. That's what how we would see it. So um, when the child is engaging in tasks that are boring, things that are repetitive, it's tedious, it's just harder for them to maintain the focus um, because these tasks don't necessarily provide this immediate and strong dopamine-related reward. Now, on the other hand, if the task is fun, if it's engaging, um, these tasks are more likely to trigger what we call a dopamine release. And it's just, it, it, it makes it easier for the individual to focus just naturally, innately. And, you know, sometimes, you know, the term ADHD can be misleading as well. Um, parents would come and say, well, 
my kid can pay attention. So th- you're still not convincing me, you know, um, I, child can pay attention. How is this ADHD? Um, the, the idea that the ch- just because a child has ADHD is unable to uh, pay attention altogether is not true. Right. So ADHD isn't about the child, the individual not being able to pay attention or focus at all, but rather it is about um, the child's inability to regulate and to allocate their attention. So in in other words, is the child able to place or redirect their attention in the spaces or places that are necessary in order for them to get the task done? Right. And usually it becomes a challenge when the task is not as fun, when it's not novel, when there's no, you know, excitement there, it's not enjoyable, right? Then it becomes much harder for the child to regulate and put their attention in the right place, so to speak. Um, We talked about distractibility. That's another core feature. Um, You know, distractibility is real, especially in this day and age. You know, we've got a lot of distractions, not even internal ones, but external ones like TV, iPad, electronic devices, phones, video games, right? So, you know, I think in society, just as a whole, we adults too, do get distracted much more easily. And so you can imagine when the child innately has a biological weakness or deficit in being able to allocate their attentional resources on focusing on their task, it is having these external distractors are more likely to make them respond to irrelevant things around them, right? So it does take them longer uh, to get back on track. Now, how does inattention play out in a child's life? What does that really look like, right? We talked a lot about the symptoms, but if we think about putting them in context um, of, of school, in the classroom setting, at home, what does that look like? Now, in the classroom, um, you may hear teachers making comments like, you know, the child, you know, he, he, you know, Johnny's just always daydreaming, or, you know, Jennifer is losing track of the lesson again. Um, You know, she just takes a long time to catch up. She takes a long time to get ready. You know, she's fumbling with her backpack, and it takes forever for her to, you know, get her books out, and then just to catch up with the rest of the class, right? These are pretty common complaints that we hear, and oftentimes it's it's a little, you know, it's quite saddening when I, when I hear this because usually this comes with, oh, the child should just try harder. You know, if only Johnny, little Johnny or little Jennifer can work harder to make this work, then they would be able to catch up. Um, we know that at this point, hopefully you are sold and believe you're believing that this is a, in fact a biological condition this is not about the child not wanting to try all right and you know think about it if the child is able to catch up they would catch up if they're able to pay attention to the instruction they would have right so being called on all the time isn't fun so we we got to have that buy in we got to believe that this isn't something that the child is choosing to do now this doesn't mean that we're just going to let them go we're just going to let them be however they want without assisting them or teaching them the right strategies we'll talk about strategies we'll talk about how to help them accommodate their needs but we got to understand and accept the fact that children with a, a, a clinical diagnosis of ADHD actually do struggle with this condition, which is a biological neurodevelopmental condition, right? So, and that's what sometimes we hear from teachers. Um, In social interactions, what does that look like? Um, The inattentive child may sometimes miss the point of conversations. They may lose track of, you know, what their peers are saying, um, you know, during recess at the playground. And they're talking about, okay, let's play this, this new game. And someone's going through the instructions and the child's like, wait, what? How do we play this? Um, Wait, can you say that again? You know, Sometimes it could cause problems, you know, peers may not have that, you know, empathy fully developed to assist the child in getting back on track. And so they could be just following along, not knowing really what is happening. They can seem, you know, quote unquote, out of it. Um, And, you know, what's important to note is that sometimes, uh, you know, people, teachers, parents alike, um, they don't realize that the child may be struggling with this inattentive type of ADHD. Um, Why? Because the child may not be exhibiting any difficulties behaviorally. They may be sitting still in the classroom, looking at the teacher, staring at the board. They're not causing problems. They're not disruptive, right? So um, they could seem like they're listening intently while they're actually zoning out 
or missing important points. And so sometimes parents and teachers may want to watch for any of these inattentive signs, right? If you see the child staring into space for a little bit or asking a lot of questions that have already been discussed, you know, repetitively, um, you may want to figure out, look at their the the work product looked at, look at their quality of work um are they always behind are they always playing catch up right so these are also some red flags and signs that you may want to pay attention um to just to see hey is my child struggling with some inattention and is this clinically um you know concerning now the other type of um, other presentation, I should say, um, it has to do with hyperactivity and impulsivity. Um, we can go on to the next slide. And then the next slide. Yeah. All right, thank you. So the hyperactivity and the impulsivity presentation, um, what are some of the complaints made by parents and teachers? Um, my child's always fidgeting, they're moving around a lot, they're always on the go, can't sit still, they're always restless, they're tapping their fingers, you know, shaking their feet, always just playing with objects, um, fumbling with things on the table. Um, they're not able to sit still in their seats. This is a very common one um, when they're supposed to, right? When they're not expected to stay in their seats, of course they won't, but we're talking about being in the classroom, right? Listening to the teacher speak. 30 minute, 45 minute, you know, um, lecture time, say a 14, 15 year old teenager expected to be sitting through a full lecture, not being able to stay in their seat or always moving around fidgeting, wanting to get out of the seat. Um, you know, hyperactivity, impulsivity, that can also be expressed vocally. It doesn't always have to be manifested just by the physical motions. It could also be, um, you know, manifested with talking, a lot of talking, um, saying too much, being too loud, talking really rapidly with pressure. Um, the child can seem impatient sometimes, um, you know, especially when they don't wait for their turn. Um, they can seem like they want to interrupt other people, always cutting people off midway and, you know, in their conversations and sentences. Um, the impulsivity type, or I should say the impulsivity presentation is quite easy to spot as well. So, um, you know, think I'm thinking about a couple of, you know, <laughs> cases that I've worked with the very strong impulsivity type. So these kids, they can appear to, you know, just act upon whatever is on their mind and, um, you know, unlikely to be considering their consequences. You know, if I just take the water bottle from my friend just because I want to get a sip of water, what is that going to do to my friend? Um, does my friend actually want to share with me they don't think much about the consequences. They don't really consider much. Again, this is not because they're being annoying or they're trying to be selfish or self-centered. It's because they're not able to control their impulsivity, right? In the school setting, we see children sometimes, like in the example I just mentioned, taking things from their classmates without asking, um, you know, on the playground or just kind of taking over without even realizing that, hey, other people are using this space. Um, they may be blurting out answers, they could be talking over their teachers or peers, talking out of turn. Um, and as I was mentioning before, these, these behaviors, the hyperactivity and the impulsivity, these behaviors are very easy to observe and they're quite easy to spot. In contrast with the inattentive presentations, um, children with just the inattentive um, difficulties are quite likely more likely, I should say, not quite likely, more likely to be overlooked um, because the child may not be exhibiting any major disruptive behaviors that will draw attention to themselves, right? So um, that's it. The, the distinction is quite important to make. Um, you know, someone can be inattentive, but not hyperactive or impulsive. And you can have a child who is hyperactive and impulsive, but is somehow able to pay attention and get work done. Um, and then we also have what we call the combined type, which is, you know, being both inattentive um, and hyperactive and, and impulsive, right? So that is a, a very common form of ADHD, All right? So I'm trying to get all of the techni technical definitions out as, as much as I can so we can lay the groundwork, the foundation of understanding how do we uh, proceed with managing these difficulties. Now, before I talk about management strategies and all the other good stuff, um, I also want to highlight another set of difficulties um, that maybe a lot of parents are familiar with, but not quite knowing where it comes from and why this is a problem. 
Um, a lot of children with ADHD also struggle with what we call executive functioning difficulties. We can go on to the next slide. And then the next slide. There we go. Thank you. So executive functioning difficulties. Um, you may have heard of this term before, executive functioning. What does that mean? So it's a it's an umbrella term. It's a broad term that is used to describe these cognitive processes that um, are involved with helping us manage um, our thoughts, control our actions, planning, organizing. Um, they're kind of like the, the boss of our brain, if you will, um, that can help us make you know, higher level decisions. Right, kind of doing the right thing, staying focused. Um, again, like, as I mentioned, the planning organization part is very important. It's a big, um, it, you know, it, it's a big chunk of the executive function. So you can kind of think of them as the skills that help us to get our daily tasks done um, and can help us handle different situations flexibly in our daily lives. Now, um, children with ADHD often report these difficulties with executive functions. What does that include? Um, organizing things, they can seem very disorganized. You're walking into a very messy bedroom. Planning is hard for them. Um, not being able to decide what to do when. If you ask them to plan a trip, it's going to be like, oh, I want to do all these things. But hey, you only have two days. How are you going to fit all that in? Well, I don't know. All I know is I want to get, I, I want to go visit all these different places. Right, so planning is a weak, it's a weak, um, weak area uh, for children with ADHD. Often prioritizing things is hard for them, meaning um, knowing what to do first, what to do second, figuring out what is more important than others. Um, initiation is another area of weakness um, in executive function, meaning it's hard for them to start, get kind of get the ball rolling to start tasks on their own. Um, managing time is hard for them. It could be a challenge knowing how to break down complicated multi-step tasks into steps, um, deciding, you know, how much time is, should I allocate on certain tasks? So man time management, I'm sure we adults all know what that means, right? Emotion regulation, in some cases, not all children with ADHD struggle with emotion regulation. Some do, not all. Um, emotion regulation, what does that mean? It means that um, the person has difficulty managing, regulating, moderating, um, especially difficult emotions, frustrations, um, um, you know, anger. Uh, a common example is a parents would say, it takes my child a long time to be soothed, to calm down. Um, they get easily triggered and it's quite hard to bring them back to where they were. It takes a lot of time for their emotions to settle. Um, emotion regulation is a, a, is what we call a very high order executive function difficulty, um, not difficulty, I'm sorry, ability rather. Emotion dysregulation is the difficulty, but emotion regulation is something that we all need. Um, and the children will continue to develop that as they get older. And so for those who do struggle with ADHD often have a harder time regulating emotions in the way that perhaps their same age peers would be able to. Um, and that can, as you can imagine, that would cause perhaps a lot of interpersonal conflicts, right? When they're on the playground playing with same aged peers, they get, child gets triggered, not understanding how to, right, to regulate their emotions. They start crying, they start yelling, screaming, they start acting up. Other kids who don't have this condition may not understand what is happening. Um, and, you know, the, the it could, you know, you know, become like this negative loop negative cycle, which makes the interpersonal relationships a challenge uh, for the child. Now, if you're wondering at all, why would children struggle with, children with ADHD struggle with executive functioning difficulties? Um, it's possibly related to the way that um, the, their brains mature, especially in what we call the frontal and prefrontal areas of the brain. Um, and the frontal and prefrontal areas of the brain are responsible for these higher order executive functions. And so in children with ADHD, this area has been hypothesized to be de developing more slowly with about an average of two to three year delay, um, or they simply function less efficiently than those without ADHD. All right. So again, going back to this whole idea of ADHD being a brain disorder, it's a biological condition. It's not something that the child is choosing to not cooperate on. Now, next slide. What are the factors that contribute to ADHD? And as I mentioned before, you know, this is a biological condition. This is brain related, but it's also influenced by a combination of different factors. 
genetic, um, neurobiological, and, and environmental psychosocial factors. I'm just going to very quickly go through these factors just for your own information. Um, now, the majority of cases of ADHD seem to reflect some degree of abnormality in brain development um, and also the chemical imbalance that I was talking about before. So there are actually structural and functional differences observed um, between the those with and without ADHD. And this is done, this has been repeated in many of the research studies that use um, neuroimaging, functional neuroimaging to look at the brains, um, comparing the brains between these children with, with and without ADHD. And this is in particular, particularly involving the prefrontal region, right? So there is consistent evidence showing that the brains of children with ADHD are smaller in size on average when compared to those who don't have ADHD, right? So there is an actual structural difference. Now, genetics play a role. Um, another question I always get asked is, well, I have ADHD. Does my child have ADHD? My older son has ADHD. Does that mean my younger son must have ADHD? So the short answer to this complex question is ADHD does run in the family. Um, you know, researchers have found that, you know, genes can actually contribute up to, I'd say, 60, 70%, so about 70% of the differences um, that could lead to an ADHD diagnosis, right? So um, adopted children uh, with ADHD are more likely to resemble their biological parents and siblings even though they are not raised or they are not living with their biological parents or sibling, right? That tells you a lot about the genetic component of this disorder. Um, you know, there's also a higher risk for ADHD in the parents and siblings of children with ADHD. So if a parent has it, the chance of the offspring having ADHD is definitely significantly higher than those whose parents don't have ADHD. And same goes for siblings. Um, all right, what about environmental factors? Now, I was talking a lot about this strong hereditary component. Um, it's There's a genetic component in there, but hey, studies have also shown that um, there are environmental factors, and these factors can indeed increase the risk of this, this, this disorder. Um, let's see, do I have a couple of them in the next slide? Can you go on to the next slide? Let me just... Okay, there we go. Now, I don't know if you guys could see clearly um, what kind of factors are listed. I won't bore you with all, every single one of them, but I just wanna give you an idea of what are some of those environmental factors that we're talking about. Um, we know that maternal smoking, um, alcohol use, substance use, um, low birth weight, very low birth weight, and prematurity, these are all pretty well studied prenatal and postnatal, uh, perinatal, I should say, prenatal and perinatal factors that have been found to increase the risks of ADHD, All right? Other things like toxins, um, you know, certain pesticides, lead, exposure to lead, high, high level of lead exposure. These things have been found to have an association with poor cognitive flexibility, attention, alertness, and these are actually overlapping symptoms of ADHD. Now, here is, um, here's something that is important to note. We can't say for sure that these are the things that would cause ADHD, right? Because these are not based on experiments, right? We can't really put someone through these, um, you know, these toxins and say, and, and then compare them with another group that has not been exposed to these toxins and say, voila, here is the reason why this person has ADHD. That would be unethical. And that's why we can't say for sure that these are the things that cause, these are the factors that cause ADHD. But the studies have shown that there is a high correlation between these kinds of toxins and the symptoms of ADHD. All right. Now, um, moving on to uh, diet, right? This is also a question that I get asked a lot. And I remember somebody mentioning that um, in, in, in one of the responses, and I think I'm going to address that as well towards the end. So um, there has been research looking at things like nutritional deficiencies, dietary patterns, what the child eats, food additives, things like that. There is currently not enough substantial evidence to say that these deficiencies or these kind of dietary habits cause ADHD, all right? There's not enough conclusive evidence to suggest that. Um, this controversial topic on whether food coloring, right? A lot of you might have heard of that. Food coloring and additives, do they cause ADHD? And this topic has been studied for, I would say, over three to four decades now. And in fact, I think 
um, the FDA actually did conduct a thorough investigation. I don't know for uh, across how many years of a span of how many years, but they conducted a very thorough uh, study looking at the impact of um, childhood development uh, as a result of these food additives and um, you know certain dietary habits. And what they found is inconclusive evidence. We still can't say for sure whether or not um, food additives and food coloring, these things actually play a part in the cause of ADHD, right? So to this day, it remains inconclusive. Um, some quickly, some just some psychosocial factors. We're looking at family adversity, low income, um, you know, family tension, difficulty with, you know, parents, relationships, um, with peers. Um, these are all risk factors. They're correlations with ADHD symptoms, but these are not causes, all right? I have to say this a couple of times. These things don't cause ADHD. Poor parenting does not cause ADHD, right? Parents, sometimes they come to me and they say, oh my gosh, I'm doing such a bad job. I must be saying the wrong thing. I must be disciplining in the wrong way, or I'm not disciplining enough. And that's why my child is acting up all the time. And I tell them, no, there's no amount of poor parenting that can cause ADHD. So no, things that you had said, or the, 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 the mean words that you must have yelled at at your child do not cause ADHD. They did not create the problem in your child. But the way a child is raised and disciplined in the family can to some extent, to some extent, affect the severity of the symptoms and how the symptoms are shown, how they're expressed, right? So even though a child cannot choose to opt out of this biological condition, um, and it's not because of poor parenting, what parents can do is to support their child with various strategies, um, certain parenting techniques, methods can help provide more structure with the child for the child um, and support their development. And that's going to be the second part of our workshop today, which, which I'm going to go over in more detail. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so bottom line, is it ADHD or not? How do we know? Um, just very quickly, a couple of things, age of onset. So um, the DSM-5, which is the manual that we use for making these diagnoses, um, it states right now, I mean, these things change a lot, but right now it states that the evidence of um, these, AD, the, the, there has to be enough evidence of these ADHD symptoms to have been present before 12 years of age. All right. Um, remember, this is a neurodevelopmental disorder, meaning it is something, it's development, it has a developmental nature for in, in this diagnosis. So um, it, this can't just be something that all of a sudden um, appear out of nowhere when you turn 35, right? It, it, th it That's not how it works. There is a chance that perhaps you as an adult may not have been diagnosed properly or no one had caught it when you were seven or eight or 10, um, but it's extremely rare. I would say we won't even be able to give the diagnosis. If the person's reporting, if a 35 year old person is saying now, well, I never really struggled with this up until last year. Oh, well, that doesn't count as ADHD. Or unless the person says, well, no, you know what? I've always been wondering about this since I was like five years old or 10 years old and somehow nobody caught it. But I always feel like I was never able to pay attention and I'm always being called on by my teacher and I couldn't follow what is being said in, in class. Hey, that is a sign. That is a red flag. You know, perhaps, you know, you as the adult, uh, when you were a child, you know, had been performing really well in school, maybe because you were, you know, you had a lot of cognitive reserves and you had a really bright mind, you're able to compensate for it, which it is a thing, um, which if maybe in the future, if we have time to talk about, you know, what it looks like in college or young adulthood, we could address that as well. But just very quickly in terms of diagnosis, how do we decide? The symptoms would have to be there before age 12, right? Because this is a developmental neurodevelopmental disorder. This is not something that all of a sudden you could acquire when you're 25 or, you know, 56. In terms of its frequency, intensity, persistence, it's got to last for um, six months. Yes, this hasn't changed. It lasts for more than six months, right? So um, if you if you see that your child has been struggling with an attention for like the past six days or six weeks because they just came back from vacation in California um, and the child has never had it, and then the child starts to, you know, uh, kind of readjusting after this two week, three week vacation, then it's not ADHD. It has to have uh, a persistent period of uh, duration um, of more than six months, or right, at least more than six months. Um, most important criteria it has to have functional impairment 
What's functional impairment? Uh, we're talking about substantial difficulties in social life, interpersonal lives. Um, they would be struggling academically. Academic under underachievement is a common complaint. Um, has nothing much to do with IQ. Um, just because the child has ADHD does not mean that the child's IQ is lower. That's this, that's not true. Um, but there's certain cognitive abilities are indeed weaker. Um, working memory, being able to focus and pay attention. Um, and these things do play in, a part in, you know, uh, the assessment of IQ. And so sometimes when we do see um, some weaknesses in, you know, someone's cognitive ability in ADHD, it's usually because of the working memory or that, you know, they're processing things slower. So processing speed is weaker in these kids. Um, Functional impairment has to have an impact on their ability to pay attention in class, their ability to get work done, um, that they're not accepted by their peers because they're always interrupting people, they're always cutting lines, they're always blurting out answers, right? So we're talking about functional substantial impairment, things that teachers and parents actually do observe and could, have, could put a finger on. Um, this isn't just, mm, I think my child is not listening. Sometimes, but not always, right? Then we'd say, okay, maybe you have a child who is sometimes inattentive or sometimes active. Um, how do we tell the difference, right? Here's another question I, I could think of. Um, I think that was that was asked in one of the, the submitted questions, but I'm just gonna um, kind of jump into it because this is relevant right now to what I'm talking about. How can we tell if it's just a child who's being active versus a child who has the true condition of ADHD? One of the main differences uh, between a uh, you know uh, an active child and one with ADHD is that again the functional impairment which I just talked about. Um, you know the child who is simply active without ADHD um, usually are able to control their actions and their behaviors, redirect their attention when they need to. Right. We look a lot at the context. So in other words, we call it context dependent. So the child who's just active, they can be energetic and they can be running around during playtime, during recess, but they would also be able to readjust once they're expected to be sitting in the classroom, paying attention to their teacher, right? They would have no problem being both energetic and active, but then also function um, when necessary, right? So that that is a big uh, difference between the ADHD or just being active. Um, you know, the functioning piece, um, ability to be able to kind of meet their age appropriate demands is another thing. Um, we, you know, for instance, we would expect say a, a 10, 12 year old, 10 to 12 year old child to be able to have some organizational skills to be able to decide what work should I focus on first? Oh, there's math, there's a math assignment due in two days. And there is the, the essay that is due in one week, right? What should come first? Um, if you see that your child is simply having trouble with kind of getting started because they don't feel like doing it, that's not ADHD necessary. I mean, it could be, but we, we can't just define ADHD by my child is not getting the work done. They're procrastinating. We, we want to also look at a full history right? Um, remember, it doesn't just appear or occur out of nowhere. There's usually some trail that we can go back in time and see, right? So this brings me to um, the next point, just jumping ahead. Um, you can go on to the next slide. Thank you. So feedback from teachers um, is very important. Um, feedback from parents, which is what we would obtain from, from, you know, the caregivers, getting the parents input, getting the input from teachers, getting input from other teachers, like their soccer coach, you know, their piano teachers, their instructors in a couple of different, um, settings, contexts. We want to, we want to be able to get a comprehensive view of the child. You know, if the child is only acting up at home, but seems like appears to be an angel in the classroom has no problem with managing their behaviors has no problem with paying attention but only this is out only happening at home when the parents are not around then we doubt that it's really ADHD why because the child has to be exhibiting these difficulties across settings all right they have to be showing these symptoms um, consistently in different settings right again because this is not by choice the child if in, a, in a true ADHD condition, the child is not going to be able to say, hmm, I'm just going to act when I'm home with my mom, but I'm going to act nicely when I'm with my teacher. They can't do that, right? So they don't pick and choose. There's no cherry picking, 
right? So um, what do I do? What do we do now if if the child is suspected to have ADHD? Of course, we want to, um, as I was kind of touching on before, you want to observe your child in different contexts. You can take notes. You can write down a few things that you've observed um, in different settings. Certainly, you could talk to the teacher. You know, teachers are usually very proactive in letting parents know how the child is doing, if the child is actually having issues in the classroom. So having these notes are going to be helpful when you talk to these, you know, medical mental health professionals about your concerns. Um, you know, it just, it can help you, it can help them to arrive at the decision and, and, and information a lot quicker because you've got some detailed observations. And of course, they're going to, we are going to do our own observations and solicit our own feedback as well. But that's something, some place for you guys to start as parents. Um, diagnostic consideration, want to clarify the diagnosis. You don't want to, you don't want to self-diagnose, right? Um, you want to clarify the diagnosis with a, a trained, um, professional. It could be a pediatrician, of course, a psychiatrist, psychologist, any other licensed mental health providers. Um, what we typically do is we would conduct, um, an interview with a parent. We want to obtain a lot of information from the parents understand the history of the child upbringing, developmental history, any delays, any difficulties when they were five, or what about when they were six, seven, eight, nine, um, you just longitudinally, we want to have a good capture of how the child has been developing. Classroom observations, when the situation allows, we sometimes do it, not always. It really depends on the severity of the symptom, depends on the quality of the feedback that we get from the parents and the teachers. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, you know, the, the input from the teacher is important. And then um, getting an evaluation, which is what we do here at the Transforming Life Center, doing these psychoeducational, psychological, neuropsychological con uh, evaluations, assessments, um, would be another way uh, to assert, you know, I'm using all, all these like jargon, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm talking like I'm writing a report. Um, these are different ways in deciding whether or not your child has the diagnosis or not. All right. So evaluations are helpful and they're useful. Um, now, what else can we do, right? Besides clarifying the diagnosis, let's say the child has diagnosis. Now what? Um, let's move on to the next slide. Right. So after you receive the diagnosis, now what? Couple of options. Now I put medication as the first one. Um, not because I want to solicit some resistance from parents. When when I bring this up during my feedback sessions and meetings with parents and consultations, um, that's always the number one thing that I get pushback from. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't have, have prescribing privileges. Um, but medication across many years and decades of well, high quality studies have shown that they're effective. All right, now, doesn't mean that every child with ADHD has to be medicated. And this is something that your psychiatrist and the pediatrician would decide on, on a case-by-case -case basis. But just generally speaking, um, there, there have been large treatment studies, um, these different meta-analyses, studies nationwide that have followed children over time to understand what kinds of medications and whether or not these medications are actually helpful. Um, there's one big one that was conducted by, I think, the NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, so they did one, this, I think it's, I want to say it's 12 or 14 month study. Um, so what they looked at was the stimulant medication. You might have heard of this term stimulants, right? So stimulant medications um, are very widely prescribed for children with ADHD. Um, and they want to understand how effective um, they are in treating the symptoms. Um, and they do find that they are effective. Um, either alone or in conjunction with uh, psychotherapy, behavioral therapy, and parenting training. Now, um, of course, the dosage, the frequency, the, the class of medication, is it a stimulant? Is it a non-stimulant? These are all decisions to be made by the pediatrician or the psychiatrist or, or the medical doctor that you'd be consulting with. Um, but just broadly speaking, medications have been found to be effective and helpful. Whether or not every child needs to be medicated, that's not something I'd be able to answer. I got, I think, a, a bunch of these questions coming. I wouldn't be able to speak specifically to that. But what I can say is, um, sir, currently, I should say, the guideline um, of um, the American Academy of Pediatrics suggests that if the child is under the age of six, we always want to start with behavioral treatment first. 
So working with a licensed mental health provider, a psychologist, a social worker, counselor, someone who is well-trained to work with the pediatric population in helping to develop some behavioral strategies, um, helping the child to understand the relationship between the cause and the consequence, the what they, if the effect and the consequence, um, you know, if I pull Johnny's hair during lunch, what's going to happen? Um, I'm probably going to get yelled at, right? My mom's not going to be happy or the teacher is going to talk to me. Okay, I'm learning this uh, this condition, this um, association between pulling someone's hair and being punished. Um, that is just a very you know cheesy example of behavioral treatment. Um, it's been shown to have um, a positive effect in reducing symptoms. Um, does the child fully, fully understand? Or, or can they fully, fully control their behaviors? Not really. It's not, a, again, the med medications or therapy alone, they're not a cure. They're, so to this day, there's no cure for ADHD, but all these different um, treatment or interventions do help in reducing symptoms, right? So we're talking about improving functioning and reducing symptoms. We're not talking about taking it away 100%. Now, this brings me to another question that someone had asked me. Um, I think one particular parent had asked, will this be outgrown when my child turns 25? Um, we can't say for sure it, what's going to happen to your child when they turn 25. But what we do know is a lot of the symptoms that the, um, parents and teachers observed when the child, let's say it's a boy, um, when this boy is 12, are no longer going to be present when they're 25. The reason for that is not because the ADHD has disappeared entirely, but because the child has learned adequate, useful, effective um, compensation, compensatory skills and strategies to be able to manage their life in a way that can help them function, right? They're going to understand after 10 years of education, going to college, going to I don't know, graduate school and finishing high school, they're going to understand that if I don't submit my work in time, I'm not going to pass. I'm going to fail and I won't be able to graduate. Fast forward, they're 25 now. If I don't get my work done, if there's a project that's assigned to me by my boss and if I don't get it done in time, I'm going to get fired. What happens when I get fired? I'm not going to be able to pay my rent, right? So there is that learning happening um, developmentally, right? So we're not talking about this as a, this is not a death sentence. The child will continue to develop. Their brains will continue to mature and grow. Um, but they will need support. They will need a lot of accommodations and um, interventions, whether it's medication or therapy or both. Um, so that that is something that parents can participate in and can do, right? So um, psychotherapy. All right, what do I mean by that? So behavioral strategies taught by therapists, that's one way, um, getting children to understand the cause and the effect learning how to reduce what we call the undesirable and preferred behaviors and developing positive replacements, understanding that if I do this, then if I do X, Y is going to happen. Well, then maybe the therapist is going to teach them. Perhaps before you blurt out that answer next time, you're going to count to five before you say anything, right? This is actually a very frequently used strategy or for kids who keep touching things or, you know, kind of bothering their friends with their hands. One thing I would teach them um, when I, when I was in my therapy role is literally to have them sit on their hands. Now, these are all, again, accommodations and, comp you know, compens compensatory strategies that we teach them. Do they take away their impulses? No. Do they take away their urges? No. But by counting to five or sitting on their hands or um, giving them a lot of movement breaks, that is going to allow them to channel their impulsivity, their fidgety uh, tendencies, or their hyperactivity elsewhere so that they can better function and focus on what they have to do, right? So these are just some quick examples of these behavioral techniques and strategies that can be learned in therapy. Um, parenting classes, what are they? Um, I'm not going to go into much detail about how these parenting classes are structured because they can actually be... Um, they, they're tailored by age of the child. Um, and I'm more than happy to send a couple of suggestions for parenting training, parenting classes for those who are interested. So the idea is to help the parents learn how to communicate to the child with the child. How can you set structure? How can you clarify expectations? 
define rules, what are acceptable, what are not acceptable behaviors. Um, how can we reduce resistance? How can we collaborate and work together with the child um, by increasing the positive behaviors and reducing the, the undesirable behaviors. So these are all things that parents can learn from these parenting training. They're very specific and they're even ones that are developed specifically for parents who um, have children that struggle with ADHD. All right. Okay, accommodations. Um, I'm assuming that a lot of parents here do know what accommodations are, um, 504 plan, IEP plans. Um, these are things, uh, I should say, I, I should clarify, these are terms that are used in, especially in public school settings. So accommodations are things that um, school districts, public school districts are legally required to provide if the child does have a disorder, it does this, have di this diagnosis um, and has been shown to be struggling academically in the school setting, all right? Um, accommodation examples, um, the school can allow them to sit in the front row to be able to have frequent eye contact with the teacher. The teacher can keep an eye on them, making sure that they're following along what they're supposed to do. That's just one quick example. Um, when you're talking about like older children, teenagers, um, when they're doing a lot of these timed tests, right? Um, in the future, PSAT, SATs, um, we know that children with ADHD are also struggling with um, not just an attention, but sometimes processing speed difficulties too. So if it takes them twice the amount of the time to be able to redirect their focus on finish on finishing just the reading of the, the question or the instruction, they're unlikely to finish the entire task, right? So is that fair? Well, probably not fair. So what we do recommend is to give them extra time. So you may have heard of this term time and a half, in writing, we usually put 1.5x, so the x stands for time, so time and a half to two times, time twice, double time for the child um, who's especially inattentive or hyperactive, um, who has demonstrated this need for extra time to um, be, be accommodated in such a way. Um, sometimes we may even ask the school, the teachers to place them in a separate setting. Sometimes it could be a library or the the you know, the AP or the principal's office or the school office where they can be monitored and supervised um, by an adult while they complete their work. Why is that? Because a lot of kids who are extremely inattentive and um, easily distracted can find it very hard to concentrate on their work when there are 20 other people around them um, writing or scribbling or making a lot of sounds. And especially for those who have some hypersensitive, um, you know, sensory sensitivities, that could be even harder. So these are just some examples of accommodations, um, extra time, um, taking tests or getting assignments done in a separate setting. Um, you know, we call preferential seating, sitting closer to the teacher to get reminders. Um, you know, for younger children, we can give them extra movement breaks, allowing them to move around to not as in moving around, like running around the classroom or pacing back and forth. No, we're talking about giving them like an intentional um, break where they can do something meaningful, sending the teacher knowing that this, this child has a specific need. Perhaps she or he could send the child to the to the secretary to pick up a pencil sharpener or to pick up the slips or memos or something, right? So to implement it, to in incorporate these movement breaks and on a regular structured basis that would allow the child to channel some of their extra energy um, so that it becomes normalized and the child doesn't feel stigmatized, doesn't have to be punished just because they need to fidget. Um, um, we also have, you know, I'm sure you guys know about these fidget spinners. There's like move-in yoga balls that they can sit on, um, these rubber bands that they can tie around their, the chair, the legs of their chairs. I mean, acids is, I mean, we are doing this pretty much in every classroom um, for all our children in, in our school. So um, these are things that you can also ask for um, from your school. If your child is deemed to need this uh, this set of accommodations and does have this uh, diagnosis and condition that impair their academic functioning. All right, so next slide, please. Okay, strategies. Now, we're I'm not going to be able to cover all the strategies that I would wish to, just because there's so many of them. And um, at the end of the slide of the presentation, I'm going to show. Uh, there are two book referrals that I often send to parents. Um, I have copies of them myself that I, I use for my kids, uh, you know, regardless of condition, because they're just very helpful and useful. Um, and I'm going to show that in just a second. So 
Um, I'm just highlighting a couple of parenting strategies that you can try at home. Um, structure, having a schedule, having a structure, creating and maintaining that structure is so important because um, they're just more likely to follow through. They're more likely to succeed and be efficient if there is a regular structure and schedule of tasks each day. I mean, think about it. Why do schools have daily schedules? Why do they have to be visible in the classroom, like pin on the wall, blown up in front of the kid's eyes because it helps the child to know what to expect next. Just finished with um, English language arts. What's next? Oh, I'm going to have pre-algebra next. What's coming after pre-algebra? Um, I'm going to have a double period of social studies. So they know what to expect. That helps with their transition. Um, it also reduces any anxiety or any unpredictability, um, which is one of the enemies of ADHD. Um, it can help just to, to, to create the sense of um, predictability and knowing what's going to come next, um, what, knowing what to expect. Um, that's going to help the child function better as well. Time management, um, organizational skills, these things can be a weakness for children with ADHD. Remember when we talked about the executive functioning difficulties, um, you know, Kids may have a hard time kind of going, getting to class or going to going from one, one spot to another or simply finishing tasks on time. Um, having the set schedule, kind of giving them maybe like a few minutes of buffer, reminding them that, well, um, you know, after English, you got to go to, you know, you have gym, you have PE. So you're going to only have 10 minutes to spare in, or five minutes to spare to jump from point A to point B, right? Knowing that this is going to happen is going to give them more of a buffer for transitioning, which is very helpful. Schedules, checklists, um, uh, you know, these are things that you can incorporate at home as well. Um, for younger children, uh, what I would like to do for my own kids is to create a daily schedule. Um, sometimes they don't really change, but for mine, I do weekly schedules and I just make it really big and I um, pin it in the kitchen on the wall so everyone sees it, right? There's no excuse that you don't know what's going to come next because it's right here. It's staring at you and you're staring at it. So you don't remember, you just go look at it. Um, communicating rules, communicating expectations is important. Um, children with ADHD, they do better with clear and simple rules, um, clear expectations that they can easily follow. If they understand it, they're more likely to follow, right? If you can write down the rules, simple, simple language, write down the expectations, again, put them in a place where your child can easily track and read. Now, you don't want to have like, a, 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 you know, a a wall with 20 instructions. No one's going to read them, right? Focus on what you think is the most important. Now, let's just say, for example, I'm just going to use my, my own kids as an example. If I want my middle schooler to um, practice piano right after she comes home, I made that up. Um, I'm going to write down piano after snack time, right? So what is snack time? Snack time is what she has after she comes home from school. Piano is next. So I just, I blow it up. I put it on the wall. I put it on, on, on the door somewhere she can see. Clear expectations. Finish this, then that, right? You would be the creative one. You can collaborate with the child to decide on what is the most important thing that you need for them to abide by. Um, so expectations make it clear. So no one is being confused. No one, there are no surprises, right? Um, clear, effective directions, commands, uh, instructions. So when you talk to them, especially for younger to, uh, parents with younger kids, make eye contact, um, tap them on their arm, tap them on their shoulder, make sure that they're looking at you when you're talking to them. You need to have their attention, right? So if you want them to, let's say you want your son to clean up after them himself after eating lunch, you're not going to yell out from the bathroom and say, hey, Johnny, clean up after yourself. All right, we're going to go in five minutes. He's not going to follow. He's not going to listen. Why? You did not get his attention. If you really are serious about what he needs to get done, you got to walk down, look at him and say, Johnny, you're done with your bagel. Can you put the plate away? Right? It's clear. It's a one step. You finish your bagel, put it away. It's a one step command. Um, make it brief. Make it simple. Make it something that is understandable and attainable, right? Um, avoid wordy statements, avoid multiple multi-step directions. Um, put the bagel away, come upstairs, put on your socks, grab your backpack, we gotta go. 
nothing that's going to get done, right? Because these are, there are too many steps to follow. Remember, they have a hard time focusing, holding on to information. So if you give them a four-step command, it's quite unlikely for them to be able to follow through. So one at a time. And if you see that the child is doing much better with following one-step command, you can tell them, I have two things that I'd like for you to do. Finish your bagel, come upstairs. All right, Johnny, what did I say? Have him repeat back to you. All right, I'm going to finish my bagel. Oh, no, not yet. What else are you going to do? What are you going to do next after you finish your bagel? Oh, okay, okay. I'm going to walk upstairs. Great. Finish your bagel, come upstairs. Repetitions are necessary. Trust that your child is trying and trust that they want to do well. So you're going to help them. You're going to be their frontal lobe and assist them, right? Reminders, prompts, um, simple directions, put things on the wall, make it clear to them. Ongoing communication with schools, with the, the, the teachers in school, um, let the teacher know. Of course, this is at your own discretion, how much you want to share, how much personal health information you want to share with the school. But generally speaking, you know, I would always suggest to the parents, I would encourage the parents to let the school know. If, you know, if my child has a diagnosis, I would tell the teacher, not because I need them to give them any special treatment or whatnot, but I need them to level the playing field. If my child has this diagnosis, I need the school to be able to work together with me and collaborate, right? It's going to help the teachers too. Let's say if I have a hyperactive and a very impulsive child, right? Teacher doesn't know that my son, I don't have a son, but let's say I do. The, the teacher may not know that my son has this condition that prevents him from being able to sit still for 40 minutes. It's not happening. What is my son going to do? Run around the classroom, bother the friend, scream and blurt out answers. Teachers don't want that. So when you explain to the teachers what is going on, there's a condition, this is why my son is, is not acting the way other children are, not because he's lazy or he's trying to be difficult, but because he has this condition. What can you do? What can I do to make it better for both you and I so that Johnny isn't going to disrupt the classroom and then Johnny can actually learn while being in school, right? So ongoing communication with the school, with the teachers. Um, next slide. Breaking down tasks, um, pretty self-explanatory. If you have a complex, um, difficult project that your child has to work on, help them break it down into steps, right? Step one, first, you collect this data. Step two, you go to the library and do research. Step three, you meet with your friends. Step four, and you guys talk about this topic, whatever it might be, right? It doesn't have to be this complex. You break it down for them. Remember, their executive functioning difficulties are real. Organization, planning, these things are challenging for them. You are going to help them break down the task, or you're going to teach them how they can use different strategies to break down their task by modeling. You know, you're going to model that um, the strategies for them so that they can learn. Minimize distraction. So that's an easy one to do. Hey, it's a, a pro, I would I, I would call the lowest hanging fruit. How do we minimize distraction? Clear the clutter from the workspace. If you have a child who comes home, do you know he does or she does homework in the dining room? It doesn't matter where dining room, you know, bedroom, study, living room. Clear the workspace. Um, take away any clutter. If there are paper, TV remote control, phone, cups, pens, remove them. Right? They don't need that much space, but they need a clear enough, clean enough space to be working that is free of clutter. Why is that important? You want the distractions to be reduced as much as you can. Remember, if you have an inattentive or hyperactive child, they're going to fumble with whatever they can find on the table, not because they don't want to work, but because that's something that is driven by, you know, their biological urges and need. So the, the, the cleaner the area is, um, the less clutter there is, the less distractions there are in the area the more likely they're going to be able to focus on what they have to do. Breaks, we kind of talked about that um, in the context of school, allow movement breaks at home as well. Um, don't expect your child to be able to sit there and work throughout for like an hour without moving. Um, give them breaks every 30 minutes, every 20 minutes, use a timer. What I do with my kids, I have timers all over my house, everywhere. I have a timer in the bathroom, I have a timer in the bedroom, I have a timer in the kitchen, one in the living room. You would not believe it. Why? Because timers are so helpful, especially for, for the younger children. They don't have a good sense of time. Again, not because they want to slack, because they just don't have that system ingrained in them just yet. So if you use an external device to help them keep track of time, it's going to help them visibly see, oh, wow. 
I thought I have 15 minutes. Well, I only have three now. I mean, they're not going to know. Even if you tell them, hey, Johnny, five minutes left. They're like, I don't know what five minutes feel like. I don't know what it looks like. Can I eat it? They, they don't know. So there are timers you can find on Amazon. Um, you can even just type in on search term. I think it's called, a lot of teachers love using those. I have a couple of them at home. You can just type in visible timer. Um, and you would be able to see those. And if you need uh, the, the direct link to it, I can send it to you. Um, th those timers actually allow you to see, allow the child to see how much time is left because it's color coded. And so these simple tricks and devices can make a difference. Um, setting expectations, you, you're gonna finish this in 20 minutes. And once you're done in 20 minutes with your work, you can take a five minute break, right? You can eat a snack, eat your cereal bar, and then we're gonna continue. Right. So that's going to reduce a lot of frustration for yourself and for your child. Um, some quick tips and strategies. Uh, next slide. All right. So just very quickly, resources. Um, these are the two books that I use a lot for myself, for my kids. I recommend a lot to um, patients and families. Um, on the left side, it's, it, there's this one, smart. it's smart but scattered. Um, this is for younger kids, they also have a version for teens. So if you just go into Amazon, you just type smarter and scattered for teens, um, they would have a separate version of the same book with different strategies that are catered towards um, older children. The other, the other one, the Everything Parents Guide to Children with Executive Functioning Disorder, um, that's another good one too. All right. So um, plenty of books you can look for, um, you know, on ADHD, on executive functioning, um, practical strategies. So we do have a little bit of time left for Q&A. And like I mentioned before, I've pre-selected a number of questions that were sent ahead of time to me by parents. Um, uh, so our communications manager and parent relations liaison, um, Ms. Linda Dela Cruz from ACIDS, she's going to help us moderate the Q&A. Linda, you're here. Yes, I am. One of our questions is, are there other ways to help my child without using medication? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So um, I kind of touched on that before a little bit. So um, behavioral treatment, um, psychotherapy, behavioral treatment, parenting skills, these are all solid, well-studied ways and techniques that can help to manage ADHD symptoms and you know improve their functioning. Um, you know, medication at this point is the first line of recommendation, according to AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics. But, um, you know, for, as I was mentioning before, if the child is under the age of six, we always want to start with the non-medication route first, try the behavioral treatment, psychotherapy, parenting strategies, parenting classes. Um, and if you see that, you know, there is some improvement, child is functioning, they just need a lot of accommodations and support, you know, you can consult with your pediatrician to decide, hey, is this medication really necessary? And if the doctor decides, you know what, she's doing actually quite okay, you know, um, then is there really a need for, for medication, right? That That's something that I would suggest you discuss with the, uh, the psychiatrist or the pediatrician. But the idea is that there are adjunctive um, treatment strategies alongside the other Kind of parenting strategies I talked about, um, in addition to to using medication, but the medication is often um, the first line of defense, and it's it's been shown to be effective. Great. Another question is when is ADHD usually diagnosed? Um, so most cases I would say are diagnosed when the child is around age seven or eight, around second third grade. That's when the symptoms peak. Um, but you know. These symptoms can uh, appear as early as ages four, ages five. You hear when they're in JK and kindergarten, um, they start receiving feedback from, from teachers. Um, girls are, yes, I'm correct in saying this. So girls are a little bit less likely to be identified at the earlier age because um, a lot of them present with the inattentive type that I was talking about before. Um, and so, because they're not disruptive, they're not loud, they're not um, necessarily defiant. Um, in some cases, most of the cases, um, they're not easily picked up on by parents and teachers alike. Um, boys do have a higher likelihood of receiving this diagnosis. It is based on research. Um, and, you know, some, some researchers thought that it's really because um, there is a different manifestation of symptoms um, between boys and girls. And so boys are, you know, they're more likely to catch the attention of teachers, parents, and doctors. So um, the answer is around age seven or eight, but there is certainly a range. Symptoms usually have would have appeared by the age of 12. 
you talked about it a little bit before, but this is a question. Is it true that boys are more likely to have ADHD than girls? Yes. So boys um, diagnosed with ADHD, they do outnumber girls um, for the reason that I just mentioned. Um, and, you know, girls sometimes don't show their symptoms um, in such obvious ways. You know, if they're struggling mainly with inability to focus and not being able to pay attention, it's really quite hard to capture, right? Unless the child themselves are able to say, hey, mom, I'm really not catching up or dad, I'm having a hard time, you know, remembering everything that the teacher asks us to do. Then, then the parents realize, wait a second, is this normal or not? But boys do have a higher likelihood of receiving this diagnosis than girls. A question back to the medication. What are some of the side effects of the ADHD medication? Um, so again, th this is just me, you know, um, making it clear, I'm not a medical doctor, no prescribing privileges, but the common side effects um, of ADHD medication, where if we're talking about stimulants, we're talking about, you know, loss of appetite, fatigue, sometimes children may complain of stomach aches. Um, these are the, the very common uh, complaints that we do hear. Um, but, you know, because stimulants are so uh, commonly or most frequently widely prescribed, um, you know, th these are the commonly reported uh, side effects, but if your child is being prescribed something called the, the non-stimulants, um, then the side effects can range from, uh, you know, in, in, in a much different way. They can present themselves in a much different way. Another question is, does sugar intake make my kid more hyperactive? Um, <laughs> great question. I think I sort of touched on that before too. There is, there remains a strong belief that increased sugar intake will make children more hyperactive. Um, but as I was saying before, you know, the studies to date um, have not been able to support that, um, that these two things have a cause and effect relationship. Um, I think, you know, when we think about diet, uh, parents of course, they want to find alternative treatments before maybe they seek out medication. They want to try many different things. I've heard like omega-3, coconut oil, um, you know, removing all food additives, no sugar intake. You know, it, these things are quite hard to sustain if you think about the sugar intake, right? Um, and, and, you know, to be honest, the, the very rigorous scientific research has not confirmed that these alternative methods are actually effective in managing uh, the symptoms. So the short answer is, um, it doesn't, there's no proof to show that sugar, increased sugar intake is going to cause ADHD. Um, there is a subset of children, I forgot which article it was, but there, there have been a couple of studies in a very small subset of children um, that seem to benefit when food additives are eliminated. But again, because the, some of the studies results were not replicated consistently, so we can't say for sure that this is actually um, something that we could say as a contributing factor or not. A uh, question from the chat. Uh, someone wants to know if there's any peer-to-peer -peer support groups for ADHD hosted by assets or other groups that you're aware of. Um, we don't have the we don't have ones that are open to the community. Um, I would need to check with our counselors to see if there are in-house peer support groups for students who are attending assets um, in the community. This is something that I've been searching for for quite some time. I do know of parenting training groups, and sometimes they do have like subsets of informal meetups that are arranged by parents themselves. Um, but I'm not aware of any organized groups, at least not within the our state of Hawaii. Um, but if I do come across anything, if there's any new groups emerging, I'd be happy to share that. We're coming up on 7:15 when the session is supposed to be over, but we'll continue with a few more questions. Uh, one of the questions is, would exploring auditory processing disorder be beneficial before considering ADHD? So auditory processing disorder is not a, a what we call a DSM-5 diagnosis. It's not a, a, a clinical diagnosis that is very well researched, um, but we, we do use this term sometimes when we feel like the child has trouble kind of attending to auditory information and not being able to keep track of it. Um, what I would suggest is to go through an evaluation process to see if, hey, is this an, an attention issue? Is this simply a working memory issue? Is there a difference between receiving, you know, auditory verbal 
information, holding on to that information versus things that they see. Now, if we see that, there's really no significant difference between how the child processes um, you know, auditory versus uh, um, visual information, then it's it's less likely to say it's it's just an auditory processing issue. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think this is something, this is a good reason why, um, you know, the child can go through a, a comprehensive evaluation to, you know, to, to do, get some rule outs to see if it's ADHD or not. Someone in the chat said that Kaiser does provide a parent group. So that's something people can check out. Um, right. Another question is, what about vitamin levels? Uh, this person's heard that iron levels are important for serotonin levels. Yes. So back to the whole idea of, you know, certain types of nutritional deficiencies, um, there is still not strong enough evidence to say that these, um, you know, whether it's iron or zinc, these deficiencies can cause ADHD. Um, at best, there is perhaps some you know, isolated studies looking at these correlation, the correlational relationship between um, deficiency and ADHD symptoms, but this is not something that has been substantially proven, um, saying that if you take more of, um, you know, a certain type of vitamin or zinc or anything else that um, the symptoms are going to improve. But, you know, from time to time, I would hear from parents saying like, oh my gosh, this omega-3 you know, pill is really doing magic. And I say, well, it, it could be a placebo effect. It could be affecting maybe the general health and perhaps the child is indeed responding. Um, and then there are also some other, you know, we call co-variables that we can't fully control. Oh, is the child also sleeping better these days? Well, that also would have an impact on improving their retention. So um, the short answer is there's not enough research to support that this kind of, um, you know, nutritional deficiency or vitamin deficiency causes or worsens ADHD symptoms. Another recommendation, as uh, someone said that the International Conference on ADHD offers some parent-oriented um, sessions that you could look into if you Google their website and check on that. Wonderful. Those are all the questions that we have so far. Okie doke. So, um, you know, I still have to, you know, kind of plug this. If you're interested in getting an evaluation here at the Transforming Life Center, please reach out to us. Um, we can, um, you know, be happy to speak more about the process. Um, our information can be found on our school website, Acids. Uh, hyphen school.org. Am I right, Linda? Did I memorize it correctly? That's the school website. Um, and, you know, for those who are not familiar with our school, Asset School is a K through 12 kindergarten through 12th grade private school. Um, we're actually the only school here in the state uh, that specializes in, you know, educating children with learning difficulties, dyslexia, learning based learning differences, or those who are gifted. So um, if you want to learn more about our school, again, visit our website. Um, assets-school.org. All right, and this marks the end of our free summer parenting workshop series. If you're interested in reviewing um, our previous workshop on communication skills and parenting, um, you can view it on the, I think it's the YouTube channel of Assets. Um, and if you have any suggestions for future workshops, feel free to send them our way as well. And we could certainly um, do this again and uh, in preparing for you know other ideas and sharing with you guys. So thank you for attending, all of you. Um, have a great night.